So if you have a copy of the Bible with you this morning, go ahead and take it out and turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. We're working through the book bit by bit in a series we call Jesus Over All. Uh, and this morning we are going to finish chapter 1, right? This is, it's kind of a big moment. It's our end of our first chapter of our first book study as a church. Like, they grow up so fast, don't they? Uh, so Colossians 1, 24 through 29. Uh, if you didn't get a listening guide on your way in, there's some space in here for you to take notes, a copy of the text, and some of the points from the sermon. Uh, so if you did not get one, you can slip your hand up, and someone in the back will make sure that one gets brought to you. Uh, but Colossians 1, 24 through 29. So last week, Seth walked us through Paul's teaching uh, in verses uh, 21 through 23 on what God has done for the Colossians through the gospel message. They were once alienated from God. They were once hostile towards him, uh, but they were redeemed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul noted at the very end of Seth's text last week that that's the gospel of which he has become a minister. And so this morning, we're going to look at the question that Paul begins to tackle. Well, what, what exactly is a minister? If Paul has been made a minister of this gospel, what does he do? He's going to reflect on his purpose as a minister uh, and give us a snapshot of what exactly it looks like to pursue the calling of a minister of Jesus Christ. So now, if you are not a pastor this morning, you might be tempted to think that you get a week off, right? I mean, after all, Paul's talking about being a minister, and, and I'm not one. So this, you know, this sermon's for me, it's for Dave, it's for Tom, um, but everybody else just kind of gets a free pass this week. Well, not so fast. See, the word that is translated here as minister is the Greek word diakonos. It sound remotely familiar? It's the same word that we translate as deacon elsewhere in the Bible, the idea of one who leads the church through their works of service. So now you're thinking, well, okay, we've roped in Seth, we've roped in David Ayler, we've roped in Todd, uh, but you still get a week off because you're neither a pastor nor a deacon. Well, not so fast again, because the word diakonos really at its root just means servant. In fact, Greek scholar A.T. Robertson has said that, that to most properly get the sense of the word, it, it means one who kicks up dust, as in one who does something, who runs an errand on behalf of someone else. So, I mean, if you're busy about doing something for someone else, you're kicking up dust. That's the, the, the mental picture that this word would have given to the original hearers. So it's a word for someone who is busy with work that's given to them by another. So when Paul talks about being a minister of the gospel of Jesus, he's talking on a most basic level about being someone who serves on behalf of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So before you decide that you get a week off this week, ask yourself, are you called to serve on behalf of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Has Jesus given, given you anything to do for his name's sake in the world? So I'm going to wager that nobody gets a week off this week. Whether you're pursuing ministry in terms of leadership in the local church, or you're just wanting to be someone who's obedient to kick up dust for Jesus, we've all got a lot to learn by looking at Paul and listening to what he has to say is involved with serving the Lord as a minister. So we're going to look this morning at what it is, what is a snapshot of a minister. And there is something here for all of us to take, to understand and to apply to our lives. So let's dig in. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, read with me verses 24 through 29. Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. That's God's word for us this morning. Let's pray as we dive into it. Our God and Father, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. What we are not, 
make us by your word for the sake of your name, for the sake of your glorious gospel. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so three points that we're going to look at this morning, three things that a minister does that are included in this snapshot. Uh, And the first one is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time, not necessarily because it's more important than the others, they're all important, but this is the one that that kind of, it takes the most work to understand. It's presented in a way that might not, might not make sense to us at first. So the first thing that we're going to see Paul talking about is we look at a snapshot of a minister. Uh, that The first task is that a minister suffers to display Jesus. Suffering to display Jesus is part of the task of a minister, a servant of the gospel. So the first thing that Paul says is, is really strange to our ears. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. I rejoice in my sufferings. Two words that do not go hand in hand together. Rejoice and suffering. Not not two things that we tend to mix really well, but that's what Paul says. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Now, you don't have to camp out very long in the Bible to understand that suffering is part of the normal, expected experience of a Christian. Right now, depending on on who you listen to, if you turn on the TV and listen to some preachers that you find there, that that might not seem like it's the case. But if we open the Bible and we look through what the Bible tells us, we're going to find really quickly that it's expected that to follow Christ means to suffer, to experience suffering of of many different shapes and sizes. Listen to what Jesus himself said, Mark 8, 34. Calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, anyone, nobody's left out of that, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So Jesus, when he was inviting followers, didn't didn't give the best sales pitch in the world, right? He didn't do what we would have done and say, hey, you come follow me. Everything's going to be great. You're going to get a bigger house, bigger car. Everybody's going to love you. No, he said, if you're going to follow me, if anyone wants to follow me, then he needs to deny himself, take up his cross, an instrument of torture, of suffering, of execution, and follow after me. Suffering is part of the normal, expected experience of a Christian. And then in 1 Peter 4, the passage that David read for us in our scripture reading earlier, it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. That's our first inclination, right? When we start to suffer, when we start to feel that God has maybe abandoned us or forsaken us, we think, why are you letting this happen, God? Right? That's, that's the problem of evil, the problem of suffering. Why would a good God allow this to happen? And so Peter says, when it comes upon you, don't be surprised. Don't, don't think something strange is happening to me. Where is God in all this? Because God told us to expect to suffer. So when you hear that TV preacher talk about how suffering is not part of the Christian life, and if you're suffering, you don't have enough faith, and you need to believe and, and lay hold of things, then you can know right off the bat that that preacher does not really take the Bible very seriously, because it's all over. We could spend a lot of time bouncing other, over to other verses and seeing where suffering is part of our expected Christian experience. But knowing to expect it is one thing. But Paul says here that he rejoices in it. Like, that's a whole new level of strength. So what's going on with this? What's going on? How how are we to rejoice in our suffering? Why would Paul say that? Like, is he some kind of Christian masochist? Is he like that creepy albino monk from the Da Vinci Code movies? Like, is that what we're supposed to be? Is that what it means to follow after Jesus? We're supposed to enjoy suffering? Well, let's look and let's think through this and and think about what the Bible tells us. We, We rejoice in our suffering. Not because the suffering in and of itself is is good. We're not supposed to just desire suffering and hardship as if there were some intrinsic value in it. But we rejoice in suffering because we have confidence that in and through that suffering, God is producing something good in us. Let's look at a couple other passages in Scripture. Romans 5, verses 3 through 5. Listen to how Paul says it here. He says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Why? Why? knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Why do we rejoice in suffering? Because suffering produces endurance in us. It builds endurance. And endurance, it builds character in us. And character gives us hope because it fixes us on Christ, who is the source of all hope. He is the source of our future. He's the source of our joy. So that's why we rejoice in our sufferings. 
1 Peter 4, the passage that we just looked at, that Dave read for us. Right after Paul says not to be surprised, or right after Peter says not to be surprised if the fiery trial comes on you, as if something strange is happening, he says, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Look at the angle that, that Peter's driving at here. He says, if you're, if you're suffering, if you're sharing in Christ's sufferings, then you can rejoice and be glad because you will, be, you will rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed, right? If we identify with Christ in his sufferings, we will also be identified with him in his glory. If we are buried with him in baptism, we will also be raised with him to walk in newness of life. The identification moves both ways. And so Peter says, when, when you are experiencing suffering, when you're identifying with Christ in suffering, know that you will be identified with him in his glory. This will not last forever, but just as his suffering was but a prelude to a glory that was to be revealed, so will it be for you. The same is true. So we don't rejoice in suffering because the suffering is, is necessarily good. We rejoice in it because God has promised that through suffering, he will accomplish his purposes in us. He will grow us in a way that we just won't grow when we're not going through suffering. So we see these different reasons that Paul and Peter say we can rejoice in our suffering. Well, why is Paul rejoicing in it here? What he says is, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. He rejoices for the sake of the Colossians, for these people he's never even met. So we have to ask the question, how does Paul's suffering help the Colossians? Well, the answer lies in what at first seems like a very bizarre, maybe even heretical statement when we hear it with our ears, that we see in verse 24. Paul says that he is filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, the church. Paul says, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now, let's, let's be real here. If you were to hear that phrase from anywhere other than the Bible, you would be like, whoa, whoa. You know, if I stood up here and said that and it wasn't in the text, you'd be like, DJ, that's probably not the most helpful way to say that. It might not be true. Like, filling up what's lacking, Christ isn't lacking. But Paul says it. And by implication, the Holy Spirit says it, so we, we need to believe it and we need to understand what is he getting at here. For their sake, in his flesh, he is filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. So he says that he's doing that, again, for the sake of his body, that is the church. So whatever this means, him filling up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions, it's for their sake, and he's doing it for the sake of Christ's body, that is church. Just as he rejoices in his sufferings for their sake, so also this filling up what is lacking is for their sake. All of this is for the sake of the Colossian believers. So we have to ask, as many Christians throughout history have asked when they come to this kind of weird sounding passage, what on earth is lacking in Christ's affliction? Think about that. What is it in Jesus's afflictions and his sufferings that is lacking? Well, we can say for sure what it's not, right? Let's rule some things out right off the bat. Remember when you study the Bible that one of the most helpful principles in figuring out weird passages like this is the principle of letting the clear passages of Scripture shape our understanding of what the ambiguous passages mean, right? We believe that all Scripture is breathed out by God. It's all given by Him. And in God who never changes, as we just sung a moment ago, there is no contradiction. There is no conflict. And so if all of Scripture comes from God, then the easy passages are breathed out by Him, and they're true, and the hard passages are breathed out by Him, and they're true, and they can be understood together. And since we're never going to find contradiction, when we come to a passage like this that is kind of messy and kind of hard to figure out, let's first go to the plain, clear passages in Scripture, understand those, and those will help us in understanding the passages like this that are not as clear. So what does the Bible very clearly say elsewhere about the sufficiency of Christ's afflictions? Well, it tells us that this passage is definitely not saying that something was lacking in Christ's atonement for sin. When we say that something is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, there was no deficiency in the atonement that he purchased on our behalf on the cross, right? He was the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. When he breathed his last on the cross, he said... It is finished, John 19, 30. 
He put away sin once for all by his perfect sacrifice, Hebrews 9.26. He did not need Paul's help to save people. He doesn't need your help or my help to save people. His atonement was full, it was perfect, it was effective. So when we talk about what's lacking, it's definitely not that. We can rule that whole category out right away. So then that, that asks the question, what was lacking And I would say to you this morning that what was lacking in Christ's affliction for the Colossian believers was a tangible picture of it, a tangible example. Paul rejoices in his sufferings for the sake of people he's never met because he knows that the way that he suffers, the way that he endures suffering will demonstrate the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. What he has preached to them in the abstract, he's now showing them concretely in his own body. He's completing Christ's sufferings by his example, showing these people how Christ's sufferings shape his own sufferings. That's what he's saying here when he talks about filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. What is lacking? A picture for these people to see this is how Christ's sufferings impact me and can then and should then impact you. Now, why should you believe me when I tell you that's what it means? Well, I think there's some help for us right here in this text. Uh, There's actually a helpful parallel to this line of thought in verse 25 that fits really well with the way that we're interpreting this text. Unfortunately, it gets kind of obscured by our English translations. So in verse 25, uh, go down just a little bit. Paul says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given me for you to make the word of God fully known. Key on that phrase, to make the word of God fully known. Why is he doing this among the Colossians? To make the word of God fully known. But if we, if we go back to the, to the original Greek in which this was written, that literally, that phrase literally reads to complete the word of God. It doesn't say to make the word of God fully known, it it literally reads that he does this to complete the word of God. And that sounds just as bizarre as the idea of filling up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions, right? What what do we, does Paul, do we need help to complete the word of God? Like, does it need added on to? Well, when we look at that phrase, every English translation that we have, whatever version of the Bible you have in front of you, renders it similarly. And it gives the sense of the phrase as fully proclaiming the word of God, right? And so, what we see there is when he talks about completing the word of God, how does he complete the word of God? By proclaiming it, by taking it off the shelf, making it fully known, and applying it to the lives of his hearers. That's why the the translators render it the way that it is, so that it helps us to understand it. But in rendering it that way, in in rendering it with some interpretation, it obscures a, a helpful parallel between verses 24 and 25. How did Paul complete God's word? How did he complete the word of God? By proclaiming it in its fullness. It wasn't lacking, but its power was made complete when it was given to people who needed it. In the same way, Christ's afflictions were not lacking, but their power was made complete when their effects were put on display tangibly to the Colossian people through Paul's own suffering. You see the parallel here, how those verses work very much the same way. That Paul filled up what was lacking in Christ's afflictions and completed the word of God by delivering them to people. God's word, Christ's example, in the abstract, doesn't doesn't do anything for someone. But when it's preached, when it's proclaimed, when it's portrayed in a faithful life, the life of a faithful servant kicking up dust for Jesus, that changes people. That is the means God has given us to accomplish his purpose in the world. So that's what Paul means. That's why he rejoices in his sufferings. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings because I have the chance to fill up what's lacking in Christ's affliction for you with a tangible example. I get to put Jesus on display for you. And I get to complete the word of God by proclaiming it to you by filling your ears with it, by introducing you to this Jesus in word and in example. You see how those two mesh right here together in the work of a servant, the work of a minister. And so the question becomes for us, who has God given you to do this for? Right? Paul's not talking about minister in terms of professional position. This isn't just about pastors. It's not just about deacons. Paul's saying, as a servant of Christ Jesus, I do these things. And if you're a servant of Christ Jesus this morning, who has God given you to do this for in this way? Who has he given you to complete the word of God for by proclaiming it? Who has he given you 
to fill up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions by suffering well and communicating the gospel in the attitude that you have in the midst of that. Now, if you're a church leader, it's very easy to see whom you've been given stewardship for. Right? Paul here in verse, in verse 25, he talks about filling up what's lacking. He says, of which I became a minister, a servant, according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. So Paul never met these people, but he realized God had given him opportunity to declare these things to them, to show these things to them, this notion of stewardship, that they were his people that God had given him to care for in this way. And if you're a pastor, then it's, it's very easy to understand who has God given me stewardship for? Myself, Dave, Tom, we will answer to God one day for the way that we teach you and for the way that we lead you, for the way that we love you as your pastors. That is a big deal. And to be honest, Tom's not here, so Dave, I'll preach you. We probably need to think more about that than we do and understand the gravity of that. If you're a community group leader, David, Tom, Seth, you have stewardship over the people who come and are under your leadership week after week, who listen to the way that you unpack the message, that you apply it to their lives, the way that you lead them in in thinking and talking about these things. You have a stewardship. So it's easy to see in that case. But what about the rest of us? What if you're not a pastor? What if you're not a community group leader? Who has God placed in your life who looks to you to help understand what it means to follow Jesus? That could be a couple categories. That could be a Christian who looks up to you in the faith, and takes their cues on following Jesus from what you do and from what you say. It could be an unbeliever whose concept of Christianity, their very idea of what Christianity is, is being shaped by what they they see and hear from you. Their concept of Jesus is being formed by your example, by your witness. Pastors and ministry leaders are not the only ones who are given stewardship by God. I want you to think about the parable that Jesus told of the talents, right? Master goes out of town. He leaves some servants in charge of his possessions. To one guy, he gives 10 talents. To one guy, he gives five. To one guy, he gives one. The guy who's given 10 goes out, invests it, produces 10 more. The guy who's given five goes out, invests it, produces five more. The guy who's given one is afraid. He digs a hole in the ground and then just gives it back to his master when he comes back. And in this parable, Jesus says that the, the master, when he returns, is thrilled with the guy who had 10, with the guy who had five, because they invested. They, they stewarded his resources wisely. The guy who had one, he was, he was upset. He says, why, at the very least, if you were afraid of me and afraid of losing it, you could have at least put it in the bank, and then I'd have some interest when I got back. But you just dug it in a hole in the ground, and it accomplished nothing. We've all been given stewardship by God, of various people that intersect with your life that don't intersect with mine, and vice versa. And God's not going to judge us on whether we return 20 or 10 or 5, but he does expect us to be faithful and accomplish something with what he stewarded to us. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even when what he has will be taken away. What has he given you to steward, great or small? one person or 10 people. It really doesn't matter. It's what has God given you and what will you do with the people that he brings into your path? When you suffer, do you rejoice? Knowing that God will use it for good in your life and in the lives of others he's given you to steward. Or or do you sink inward? Do you fall into despair, self-pity, and deny through your actions the hope that you profess in Jesus Christ? Are you completing the word of God in the lives of the people who are around you? Are you proclaiming it to them in fullness? Are you making it fully known? The the Christians or the unbelievers who are around you, do they have a full understanding of who God is, of what he says, because they know you, because they encounter you? Are you taking God's word off the shelf? and applying it to people in word and in deed. Because a minister of the gospel is necessarily involved in suffering to display Jesus. We communicate Christ through the way that we live, through the way that we speak, and that comes out most clearly, most clearly through suffering. 
right? This, if you're not suffering today, you can still be doing this. You can still be a, a speaking, breathing, living example. But I think suffering is such a big focus in the New Testament because nothing gets our attention quicker, right? I think it was C.S. Lewis that talked about how pain is the megaphone through which God shouts to humanity, right? He can communicate to us through blessings, through good times, and he certainly does We're to, to, to rejoice that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. But when we suffer, when the bottom is pulled out from under us, we cannot escape dealing with the difficult questions, and that forces us to Christ. It forces us back to him and it forces us to rely on him deeply because we lose any sense, any, uh, any sense of pretending that I can do this myself. That's why Paul rejoices in his sufferings because he knows this is probably the best tool in the box that I have for communicating to people the gravity and the wonder of the gospel. So I'm not asking you to be a Christian masochist this morning, but what I am asking you to do is that when you suffer, when you have opportunity to bring that tool out of the toolbox, rejoice that you get to use it. Rejoice. Because you will know that God is doing something, accomplishing something through you in the lives of other people. And for you as well. You'll grow in godliness as you do this. Well, next, in verse 26, Paul takes a moment to talk about this word of God that he's making fully known to them. And he talks about stewarding the mystery of redemption. So a minister is involved in struggling or is involved in suffering to declare Jesus, to display Jesus, and he's involved in stewarding the mystery of redemption. Verse 26, make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Paul takes a moment to talk about the word of God, and he calls it the mystery hidden for ages and generations. So what is this mystery that a, that a minister is called to steward? If you're a servant of Jesus Christ, Paul says that we steward this mystery. We carry this mystery that has been hidden for ages and ages. Well, in what sense is God's gospel, is the word of God, a mystery? Well, the mystery stems from the promise. We've got to go way, way back in time to Genesis chapter 12, where God makes a promise to Abraham. And he says that he's going to bless Abraham, and he's going to make him into a great nation, and that would become the nation of Israel, God's people. But he doesn't stop there, right? He says, I'm going to make your descendants more numerous than the sand on the seashore, which is an incredible promise. But he doesn't just stop with what's going to come of Abraham's lineage, of his family. He says that through Abraham, all the nations, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's a huge promise. And the mystery comes in that, that how that would happen, how that would be fulfilled, remained mysterious and hidden for a very long time. Trace the, the line of God's people through the Old Testament. And God worked among them in great and powerful and amazing ways. And those blessings certainly did bleed over into the Gentiles that they encountered, the people who were around them. Right? Rahab, a, a Canaanite prostitute, is grafted into the line of the Messiah. Ruth finds redemption with the people of her late husband. The people of Nineveh are granted mercy and repentance by the preaching of a reluctant prophet named Jonah. We see God's blessings spilling over to the Gentiles around the nation of Israel. But nothing happened on the global, all-encompassing scale that this promise suggested. That remained a mystery. How is it that God is going to bless all the peoples of the earth through Israel? It seems like we're running way behind here, God. How are you going to fulfill this one? But now, God has revealed to his saints how great among the Gentiles are the riches of his glory. Through Jesus Christ, every tribe, tongue, and nation has been brought near. There is no longer Jew and Gentile, slave nor free, Greek, barbarian. There is one people of God, united not by the bloodline of Abraham, but by his faith. That happened through Christ coming into the world in the fullness of time. God sends his son and he begins to send out the gospel into every far corner of the earth. 
Like, think about this. Stop and pause and think about where we are and trace that back to 11 scared guys in an upper room after the resurrection in some backwoods corner of the Middle East. Illiterate guys, fishermen, uneducated men. And from there, God sends out this mystery. He reveals it to the world. And now we sit here this morning on the other side of the planet, 2,000 years later, and we praise the name of Jesus. We are ones who have been grafted in to God's story, to his people. And there are people who are on the other side of the planet in that same place who are still gathering this morning and they are worshiping. And there are people in South America who are gathering and worshiping. There are some people in a tribe in the Amazon who are nothing like you, who are nothing like me. We would struggle to find anything in common, but they worship Jesus Christ this morning. We are part of the same family. We are part of the same tree. We are part of the same promise. The mystery has been revealed in you and in me as we trust in Jesus Christ. To us, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of his glory. This mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul is laboring for the hope of glory. Jesus transforming and remaking the world in his image through his people, called from darkness and into marvelous light by the power of of the gospel message. I want you to grasp this picture of the gospel that's being portrayed. Because I think a lot of times, we, when, we, when it comes to the gospel, we're like those people on Antiques Roadshow. Everybody seen Antiques Roadshow? Do you know what, the, what I'm talking about? You know, the show where people go on and they bring their old stuff and they get told if it's you know, valuable or if it's junk or whatnot. And I, I kind of feel like we're the people who walk in with some priceless trinket that we found dusty in grandma's attic and we bring it forward and the guy appraises it, and, and he says something to the, to the idea of, do you, do you know what you have here? I think so many times we don't, we don't understand what we have. We don't understand the wonder of this gospel. And it's so easy, right? It's so easy to go through life, especially if you've been in the church for any length of time. Like, we know this. This stuff is like, we could recite it every way to Sunday, backwards and forwards. And it, it becomes cold. It becomes common. There's nothing common about this gospel. There's nothing common about what it is doing in you. This is a mystery for ages hidden. Things that angels longed to look into, the scripture says, revealed in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are stewards as ministers. You are stewards given care of the gospel message. A mystery revealed, a promise fulfilled, the great cosmic longing of all creation brought to fullness by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is the message that Paul strived to make fully known. This is the message that he rejoiced in suffering because it allowed him to show this to the Colossian people. It allowed him to, to put this Jesus on display, the hope of glory. You, as a steward of or, or as a minister of Jesus Christ, as a servant of Jesus Christ, as one who is kicking up dust on his behalf, you steward this same message. As a minister of the gospel, as a servant, how are you stewarding this? How are you making this known? And does it come out in your countenance, in your attitudes, in your words, in your actions, that you understand the gravity of what you have? Do you know what you have here? Do you understand its value? Do you understand its wonder? Or does it carry the same significance as some little trinket you found in grandma's attic? It might look nice. It's nice to bring out and show at parties, but I mean, what's it really matter, right? Do you know what you have here? Steward the mystery of the gospel. It's Christ that Paul proclaims. Then he makes clear in verses 28 through 29 that this is not a casual, lazy proclamation. Right? He's not just tossing Jesus out there and letting everybody do with it what they wish. No, because the final piece of the, the job of a minister, the role of a minister that we're going to look at this morning, is struggling to build mature Christians. Right, Verse 28, Paul says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. He says that he warns everyone and he teaches everyone. Why? Seeking to present everyone mature in Christ. Paul is not a spiritual deadbeat dad, right? He doesn't father some spiritual kids and then just leave them to figure out life on their own. 
but he's investing in them deeply. He's seeking to grow them into maturity. Present everyone mature in Christ. That's his job. That's the task of a minister. You're not just casting the gospel out there, inviting people to follow Jesus, and then great mission accomplished. We're seeking to present people mature. So how do we do that? How does Paul do that? He talks about the two tools he uses are warning and teaching. Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Now, warning sounds negative, right? When you hear the word warning, like we think of, hey, don't do that. Don't do that this negative connotation. But really, the word that is being translated here as warning is a lot broader than that. The NASB, if you use the NASB as your Bible translation, it uses the word admonishing everyone. Uh, And that probably gives a little fuller sense of the idea, even if it's not really as common to our vernacular, like admonishing is not a word that you probably threw around much at all this last week. But it gives a fuller sense of what he's getting at here. This word doesn't strictly mean correcting, like warning seems to indicate to us, although it certainly includes that. But the word indicates what it represents is appealing to someone and urging them to choose that which is best. And it has a particular sense of appealing to the mind, to someone's logic, to someone's reason. So when when Paul talks about warning everyone, what he's saying is, is I appeal to everyone. I, I lay out to them the truth of the matter and I urge them to choose that which is good, that which is best. I admonish them to follow Jesus. And don't Paul's letters bear this out perfectly for us? If you read Romans, if you read Colossians, if you read the pastoral epistles, you find that he doesn't just go around telling churches, hey, do this, do this, don't do that. This is how you need to do it. And what does he do? He proclaims and he portrays the fullness of the gospel message. He teaches them the gospel. He teaches them how it relates to the situations that they find themselves in, how to make those connections. And once he lays that map out, then he urges them, follow Jesus, put this off, put this on, live in accordance with these truths which you have heard, which you, which you cling to. Choose Christ, follow him. He urges them to lay hold of the truth found in the gospel and live in accordance with it. Do you admonish people in that way? Proclaiming the gospel isn't just about communicating information. And this is one that, so there's, there's two kinds of, there's two ways you need to hear this, depending on what kind of person that you are. If you are a confrontational person, then this is the point where you're like, all right, let's go. Let's go tell people how it is. Back off a little bit, all right? You know, when, when we see passages in scripture like this, we think, you know, is this, this is just license for me to, to give into my base instincts and be a jerk to people. Like, look through Paul's writing. Do you, do you find Paul the jerk coming out? to people here when he talks about admonishing and warning people? Because it it, it can be self-serving to us. We think, you know, I'm just going to go around, I'm going to admonish people, I'm going to tell them how it is. And then, surprise, surprise, people don't like you very much and they get very upset. And then you can just say, well, the gospel's going to offend people, so it doesn't matter if you don't like it. And it can become a way to mask some really deep-seated sinful tendencies in us, right? And so when you read this passage, I want you to think less warning and think more admonishing. Are you laying the groundwork that Paul lays? Are you talking about the gospel? Are you showing people, teaching them how to make the connections between gospel and life? And then once you've done that, say, choose Christ, follow him. Does your admonishment have a foundation in the gospel? Or are you just going around telling people, hey, you need to follow Jesus. But then there's the other kind of person, and I'll put myself more in this category. I don't like conflict right? It's not my favorite thing in the world. And I try to find ways to avoid it, if at all possible, and shy away from it. But the gospel is necessarily confrontational. And that's difficult when you don't like conflict. My temptation is, when I put the gospel out there, like, hey, I'm not, I'm just a messenger. I'm just telling you these things. I'm just telling, I'm going to give you all the information about Jesus, and then you do whatever you want with it. But that's not what Paul says he does here. He admonishes people. He warns them. He doesn't just teach them. He doesn't just say all these things to them, but he gives them a follow Jesus. Don't turn back. Press on. Do this. He gives imperatives. Do you ever give imperatives to the people that you're teaching about Jesus Christ? Do you ever tell people, follow him, cling to him? 
because we need to come out of our shells a little bit sometimes and realize that we're not just teaching a class about gospel. We're urging people, pleading with people, be reconciled to God, right? Are we, are we warning and admonishing people in this way? And then second, are, are we following Paul's pattern of being rich in gospel truth? Think about this as you, as you discipline your kids, as you live with your spouse, as you confront a friend in their sin. Are you filling, are you using as the foundation for every imperative that you give a richness of truth, who it is that God is, who it is that you are, what Christ has done and how it relates to life? But Paul also talks of teaching, right? So we have warning slash admonishing, and then we have teaching. Why do we we think teaching is a big deal? Because the minister, the servant of God, understands that people's maturity in the faith will never exceed their grasp of the gospel and their knowledge of God's word. Never. Faith is not just about knowing things, but you will never go farther than the truth that you know about God. I I dare say that if you give me a picture of a person's devotional life, what are they reading? How how much are they spending in the Word? What do they know about God's Word? I can probably predict with a fair degree of accuracy the vibrancy of their spiritual life. Now, it's possible to know all those things and not have a vibrant spiritual life. That's certainly possible. We can be filled with book knowledge and head knowledge and pride and be puffed up and not actually put it into action. But it is also not possible to have a vibrant spiritual life without any of those things, without the knowledge, without the word of God filling us. And so Paul knows that a minister, a a steward, a servant teaches people. And this isn't just about classroom instruction. As soon as we say teaching, that's what comes to mind. It's, well, this morning, please turn to the book of Colossians. We're going to teach you today about God. I can teach my kids the Bible by opening it up and reading to them. And I should. Like, I'm not... I'm not down in that at all. But I also teach them when I talk about how it should change the way they treat their friends or the attitudes that it should shape inside of them, right? Teaching happens, if we're going to quote Deuteronomy, when you lie down and when you rise, when you sit at home, when you walk by the way, right? We need to be in the word of God, reading it, consuming it, getting it down deep in our hearts. But one of the goals for which we have it down deep in our hearts is so that when you're walking down the street with someone and a situation occurs and the Bible becomes immediately relevant, you can say, man, that's just like what it says here in First Peter. It's just like what, what Jesus said when he was teaching the crowds, when he told this story, when he told that story. That's teaching. Teaching isn't lecture. Teaching is taking the word and applying it to life. While we think of warning and teaching as cerebral exercises, they are much more than that. This is life. This is gritty. This is real living that Paul talks about here. And I want you to notice the way that he talks about going about it. He uses the language of hard work to describe this process of warning and teaching people. That we might present everyone mature in Christ, for this I toil, struggling with all the energy that he powerfully works within me. He says that he toils and he struggles with all the energy that God gives him. Just just take a moment, pause. When I say the words toil, struggle, and energy, what kind of mental picture do you get? What image pops into your mind? What kind of of, uh, situations do you envision? This is the language of work. It presents a picture of somebody who is struggling, who is striving, who is sweating. Why? Why? to present everyone mature in Christ. I toil, I struggle with all this energy, teaching and warning so that we can present everyone mature in Christ. Do you put your back into your Christian walk? What about ministering to others? You ever put your back into that? Do you ever come home at the end of the day spiritually sore because of the work that you've been exerting? Do you just minister to others when it when it just kind of comes to you when it's easy? Like do you do you hit the everybody can hit a softball, right? If we have a Trinity softball team, uh, we might might or might not be very good. Uh, we'll just leave that a mystery. But like everybody can play softball. That's one of the fun things about softball is you might not be the best at it, but when you're pitching a ball like this, everyone can hit it at some point along the way. Do you do you just swing at the softballs? 
Or do you spend hours every week in the batting cage learning how to hit the 87 mile an hour curveball that dives away at just the last moment? Like nobody naturally hits pitches like that. World Series is going on right now. You flip it on tonight and you watch. Like these pitchers are throwing some nasty stuff that moves and it flies. Like if you're standing in there, I can't just walk up on the field, take a bat and instantly be able to hit that kind of pitching. Guys practice for years, for decades to be able to hit a pitch like that. So which approach do you take? ministering to others, to your spiritual life? Are you just content to hit the easy stuff? Or do you work towards learning how to hit the off-speed, the curveball, the 90-mile-an-hour fastball? Are you practicing? Are you striving? Do you squeeze in the work of of the minister, of the servant, when it fits with your life and priorities? Or do you rearrange your life and schedule as needed to faithfully present others mature in Jesus? When was the last time you changed plans so that you could build Jesus Christ into somebody? When when your life, when your routine gets busy, gets full, what's the first thing to go? Is it your time in the Word? Is it your time in community with other people who God might be using you to shape and mold? And we got to be careful here not to, we're going to touch on this here in a minute. We, we want to be careful not to say that this is all about, you know, you know, work and effort and God just wants you to do, 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 do. And if you're not doing this, then you're guilty and you need to just work harder, try harder. But it says he toils. It says he struggles with all his energy to do these things. So let's just hear the imperative the way it is. Do you struggle? Do you toil? Do you work? As a steward of the gospel, as a servant of Jesus, To kick up dust, you have to kick. You have to be busy. If I'm strolling leisurely down the street, no dust is being kicked up. Follow the imagery and go where it leads. Toil, struggling with all his energy, but he powerfully works in me. This is a snapshot of a minister. This is what a servant of Jesus Christ is supposed to be about. Paul presents a powerful example to us this morning. So, how do we respond? Well, I know when I'm provided, when I'm, when I'm given an example, I usually can respond in one of two ways, right? The first, exam, or the first way I respond is that the example can serve as motivation, right? I think, I want to be like that. Yes. It can shake me out of apathy and laziness and spur me on to be more like Jesus. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and that's your reaction. You hear this and you think, man, I want to be like that. I don't know what God has for me, but I want to follow him. I want to toil and strive and struggle. I want to steward this glorious mystery. I want to suffer like Jesus and show people Jesus in the way that I suffer, in the way that I live, in the way that I speak. I want that. And if that's your reaction this morning, then let's go. Then lay hold of that and follow it. Let it drive you out of here this morning. Pray for grace and power to strive forward as a faithful minister, as a faithful servant. And here's the challenge that I'm going to give you this morning, because when I, when I see an example like that, and when it motivates me, and you get all jazzed up and you want to follow it, it's easy to, to walk out the door pumped, and then Tuesday comes and you're like, did anything really change this week once the high kind of wears off? So here's my advice to you. If you're pumped up, if you are encouraged by this example you see in Paul, I want you to think about a basic, practical, concrete step that you can take this week to be obedient to what God's calling you to do. If you need to do more toiling and struggling with all the energy that that God works in you, I want you to, your, your homework today is brainstorm what is one basic, simple thing that you can do this week to be more obedient to do this. Maybe it's, I'm going to be in the Word every single day. Maybe it's, I'm going to be in the Word at this time every single day. Maybe it's, I know I'm going to run into this person and we're going to talk about this stuff and I'm going to have the chance to speak God's word into them. I'm going to do it. Maybe it's, I'm experiencing a lot of suffering, but I'm going to rejoice so that people can see my hope and I'm not contradicting my hope in the way I live. Whatever it is, basic, concrete step. What is a line you can put in the sand where you can say, I am being obedient to follow the example that Paul gives? That's not always how an example feels. Other times, an example like this can feel crushing, right? I see how great the task is, how otherworldly the example seems, and I know I'll never be able to get there, so I despair. You ever feel like that when you see an example like this? 
Like I read about how Charles Spurgeon or Jonathan Edwards or whoever spent 37 hours a day in their study writing sermons and books and preaching and doing all these things. And I just say, you know what? Forget it. I'm going to sit on the couch, eat some Cheetos and watch a dumb show on TV because I am never going to get there. Never going to be that guy. Never going to be that preacher. If that's you this morning, if you see Paul's example here and you say, throw in the towel, it's not me. Never be that. I want you to key in on a few specific phrases in this text that you will be tempted to overlook. When you think about this text, 24 through 29, you're going to be tempted to overlook these phrases. I want you to key in on them very clearly. Paul says he became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. He says, talking about the gospel, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. And then here at the bottom, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. Notice the passive nature of those phrases that I point out. It is God who gives stewardship. It's God who gives you opportunity. It's God who has revealed his glory, Christ in you, who has given you your hope. And it's God that gives you the energy to work. Paul didn't toil and strive with all his energy He says, I toil and strive with all his energy, all Christ's energy, all God's energy, that he powerfully works in me. The Bible's full of this. It calls us to work all the time. It calls us to do, to strive, to believe, to hope, but it always connects it to what Christ is doing in us. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. One of the most fearful and trembly passages in all of scripture. For it is God who works in you. You work because God's working. It's not up to you to just well up enough and go and get it. And so this morning, if you hear this example and you think, there's no way I'm going to get there, you don't have to be good enough. You'll never be Spurgeon. You'll never be Edwards. You're not them. You're not supposed to be. You ever think about that? You're not supposed to be someone else. You're not supposed to do the work of a minister just like that guy does, just like that girl does. You're supposed to be faithful and obedient to what God calls you to do. Now, Don't read this as setting a low bar, right? Because that's another temptation is if I set low expectations, I win every time, right? And so don't worry about trying to do all these things that these other people do. You just, you know, keep it nice and simple and you'll always meet the mark. It's not about that. What it is about is being faithful to steward what you are given and not what somebody else is given. What opportunity does God give to you to grow in godliness, to lead other people to grow in godliness, to show Christ to others. It does, like almost everything in life, it seems, take me back to the words of the great philosopher Gandalf. When Frodo is on his way to Mount Doom to cast the ring into the fire and save the world, and he feels despair, and he says, what does he, what does he say? He says, I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. And you know, Gandalf says, well, so does everybody who lives to see a time like that. That's not for them to decide. All you have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to you. Don't worry about what opportunities God is going to give. Don't worry about if you could do the job that God's given to somebody else in the way that they're doing it. You be obedient. You follow the opportunities that he gives to you to pursue Christ, to lead others to Christ, to show others Christ. Not every hobbit has to take the ring to Mount Doom. It was just the one, two, if you count Sam. Some hobbits are just called to be good hobbit moms and dads, to work at good hobbit jobs, work with excellence, be good neighbors. You don't have to be somebody else. But when opportunity arises and you recognize it, be faithful to throw everything you have at it. When God gives you the opportunity to speak Christ into somebody's life, to demonstrate in your attitudes in the midst of gut-wrenching suffering the wonders of his glory, to dig deeply into his word, to know it, to fill yourself with it. When those opportunities are presented, go and take them. Work, toil, struggle with every ounce of the energy that he gives you in order to do it. Fill up Christ's afflictions for the sake of others. Complete the word of God. Don't look the other way. 
That's when disobedience comes. Not when you don't do what God's given someone else to do, but when he places something before you and he, you know, you see this is going to be hard. It's going to demand something of me and you don't, you walk the other way. You take the easy road. Strive, toil, work. Don't be intimidated by the example of Paul, but understand that just as Christ gave Paul energy and powerfully worked within him, he will do so for you with whatever he brings your way. Do the work of a minister. Be a good servant. Kick up some dust this week. In whatever way, God gives you opportunity. For it is God who works in you to do according to his good purposes. He that will give and do far beyond what you can ask or imagine. Suffer to display Jesus. Steward the mystery and wonder of the gospel struggle to build mature Christians. You and whoever God brings into your path. That's a snapshot of a minister. That's what a servant is. That's what a servant does. And that's what let's pray that we can be and that we can do this week. And what better way to set that in stone in our minds than by observing communion. And then by being reminded tangibly in a real sensory way Jesus has given us everything we need. His body was broken. His blood was poured out so that we could have new life, so that we could have the mystery of of the glory of his goodness and his grace to the Gentiles revealed in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you take the bread, when you tear it off, when you dip it in the wine, when you remember his death, remember that the hope of glory now rests within you and that he powerfully works within you to give you the energy to accomplish whatever comes this week. It's not because you're good enough. It's because of what Christ has done, what he's accomplished, it is finished. Redemption is purchased. It was perfect. The only filling up you have to do of what's lacking in his afflictions is not completing atonement. It's presenting them to the world. And you can do that because he's in you and he's with you. So in just a moment, Seth and Jen are going to come. They're going to play. They're going to give us some time for reflection and reflect on these things. Think about the example that we've seen from Paul and how you need to respond to it this morning. Pray, repent, ask forgiveness, ask for strength. And then when the time's right, when you're ready, go to the back, tear off the bread, dip it in the wine, and remember who Christ is. Remember what he has accomplished and remember the hope of glory that it builds in us. We're going to read from 1 Corinthians to set this in our minds. Let's go ahead and bring the passage up here. Read the underlined portions with me. Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, he said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. So eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Amen. Examine yourself. Seth and Jim, come on up. Play for us. I'm going to pray. And then when the time is right, move to the back. Uh, Remember you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes, which looks back and it also looks forward. Because Jesus is not dead in the ground, as David talked about earlier. We hope in a risen Christ who could conquer death, and he can conquer whatever is is facing you this week. So think back. Think forward. This is also the time that we give. There's a basket in the back if you'd like to to give during this time. You also have the option to give online. But we give in in response to this. Everything we do is in response to this gospel. Everything you're going to do this week in response to this sermon is in response to this gospel that Christ came lived, died, and rose again. So let's pray, and then uh, and then we can take communion and we'll worship together in song as we close out our morning. God of grace, you are so good to us. 
you have revealed a mystery of glory beyond our comprehension. You have grafted us into your people, your family, not because we're good enough, not because we're smart enough, but by a sheer show of your grace, by the kindness of your will. Father, as we, as we look at this example this morning, we consider what you've called us to be as your servants. God, I pray that you would guard us from despair, from thinking there's no way I can accomplish this. God, may you spur us on to love and good deeds. May you spur us on to be like Christ, to bring glory to his name, to toil, to struggle with everything that you give us, to present everyone mature in Christ, to to get there ourselves, to, to, to dig into your word, to approach you in prayer, to pursue godliness and holiness, and to do those for others. God, help us to be faithful stewards of whatever and whoever you give to us, whether it's 10 talents, five, or one. God, just don't let us dig a hole in the ground and neglect so great a calling, so great a privilege. When we're tempted to despair, when we're tempted to give in, when we're tempted to sit one out, remind us that our Savior bled and died for us he died and he rose, that death and Hades could not hold him, but now he holds the keys. He is the risen one. He is the Lord of all creation. And that hope of glory is him in us. Help us to toil and struggle with all the energy that you give and to be thankful for every ounce that you provide. God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. God, we ask that you would be with us, that you would help us to abide in you this week as we go forever. Apart from you, we can do nothing. All the encouraging words, all the great examples will not be effective unless we remain in Christ and he and I. So help us to pursue him this week. Give us grace for every hurdle. Forgive us where we will fall short. But help us back up us to encourage one another, to love one another. God, you have given us each other at the very least to steward in the gospel. Thank you for Trinity Church, for the people who fill this room, for the people who are down the hill with the kids, God. Thank you for the the gift that they are to me, for the encouragement that they are to me, for the friends that they are. Unite us, we pray, Father. Grow in us. Grow us into a people who fills up what is lacking in your afflictions for the city of Crestwood. Who completes your word by proclaiming it in its fullness. Words, deeds, attitudes make us faithful. Help us to bring you glory, we pray in Christ's name and for his sake.